Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. She's not a Christian! Give it up, y'all. Your portal to the paranormal, esoteric, and all things spiritual. She's tampering in and dark sided stuff! And now, your host, Truth Seeker. Yo, what's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, what's going on? I'm Truth Seeker. This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. Excited, delighted to be with you guys again today. As always, you heard the disclaimer, you heard the intro, we just discuss all things spiritual. Um, leave no stone unturned. We try to cover a little bit of everything and just have that conversation. So hopefully you get something out of today's conversation. Maybe your life will be changed. Maybe you hear about some new sciences, spiritual technologies that can help your life and benefit you in some way. All I can do is share the things that have been working for me. And uh, usually when the guests come on, they do the same thing. They let you know, look... I've been down this road. I've tried these other things. They don't work. This is what's working. And usually that has something to do with spirituality. So that's what we're going to be talking about today with my guest. Um, Can't go any further without saying a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, everybody who believes in my work and would like to support financially. Thank you guys for believing in me and uh, and what I'm doing with the music and the podcast and uh, the articles and all that kind of stuff. So if you'd like to support, please head on over to patreon.com backslash true seeker there you get access to my entire discography of music which is 200 plus songs you also get access to um, our thursday night school of the mystics which is the community aspect to what we're building here which is tonight so we're going to be doing that that's our video chat discussion hangout teaching all that kind of stuff really community and family and we're going to go we're going to go into that a little bit today on on the broadcast talk about the importance of finding your community finding your tribe but you get access to all that cool stuff by supporting on Patreon for any level of giving. So patreon.com backslash true seeker. Shout out to everybody um, hanging out already in the Facebook and YouTube and Periscope and Twitter and all that. Uh, Twitch, everywhere we're streaming live. Shout out to you guys holding down in the comments section. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring on my guest today, Lola Scarborough. Lola, welcome to the podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Thank you for having me on, Tuesday. I've been looking for this uh, interview for a while now. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we tried to do it probably a month ago, and uh, some stuff came up, but we rescheduled, and here we are. <laughs> so, yes. again, welcome to the show. I think uh, always, I, I like to jump into conversation, but let's just start just kind of giving uh, people just a little bit of background about who you are and what you bring to the table. It'd be a good place to start. Okay. Well, I am a deeply spiritual person. I say I I put it to win with the mark of spirit on me. Um, I come from a deeply spiritual family. And I've had all different kinds of experiences. Right now, um, I own a yoga and wellness studio with my husband here in Lake City, Texas. And I do a lot of hands-on healing, which is where I really connect very deeply the mystical part of who I am. 
my yoga practice is Kundalini yoga. And I came to it through what was an accidental, spontaneous Kundalini awakening. And I know some people may not be familiar with those terms, but I can explain them later if you like. And so it led me so deeply into a journey with that so fraught with, you know, at first it was fraught with turmoil and fear, but as I went along, I it took me deeper and deeper into the mystery of the yeah. universe. Spontaneous kundalini awakening. Like if someone has a kundalini awakening, shouldn't we plan for it? Like what the heck is a spontaneous kundalini awakening? It's a terrifying event if you don't know what it is, and I didn't. So I've been doing hands-on healing and kind of surfing around in the spiritual world, like I said, ever since I got here and I became a hands-on healer at 12, my grandmother taught me. But I joined a group. I was, I think I was 36 at the time, and we were going around doing all kinds of healing work. And I'd never heard of yoga um, in the sense of I never really knew what it was. And the word Kundalini, I read, I'd read Carl Jung and some of his stuff. So I had heard the word, but I didn't really know what it was. So the group I was with, the teacher taught a mantra. It's called the Gayatri Mantra. And it's um, one of the most used Hindu mantras. So I just started chanting it. I loved it. And then all of a sudden I was chanting it all of the time. And it, they say, first you do the mantra, then the mantra does you. And um, I started having all of these weird kinds of symptoms. And I'd never heard of a Kundalini rising. I mean, and um, it actually, it lasted for, it took almost 12 years to finish cycling. But I would hear voices, I would run fevers of 106 degrees. Um, and I would have visions, I mean, full out visions. So a kundalini rising is a nervous system event. One of the things you notice first is you start tremoring and shaking. You'll feel like your legs are on fire um, and your feet are burning and you get rushes of almost manic energy. Um, and I did not know chanting mantras could raise kundalini. I learned it the hard way. And by then I had dropped off from the healing group because if I had stayed with it, I'm sure he would have told me what was going on. <laughs> So one day I'm sitting out and I called it my own shack. That's where I did my healing. And I was doing all my weird, I was chanting because the voices told me if I stopped, it would kill me, whatever it was that was happening to me. And I looked up and there was this vision and I, this is the truth. I swear, as weird as it sounds in front of me was a cross legged yogi with a long beard, with a turban on his head, all in white. And he told me, he said, you have to do kundalini yoga or what you're going through is going to kill you. Um, and I didn't even know how to spell kundalini. It took me a while to figure it out. But then I found a center that was about 25 minutes from my house. Um, kundalini yoga is hard to find. Yeah. So it was a real blessing for me. And after the first session, things started to settle down. But you get um, rushes of energy, uh, and there's a, there's a process that it follows. And once I knew what it was and I went out and looked at what was happening to me, I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what has been happening to me. But one of the neatest experiences I had was at one point during this whole uh, process, um, I talked with the angels almost daily and they would the way they spoke, it was in a different language, but it was like I could understand it. And so they would talk, 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 talk. And I'd be like, well, who, who can I tell this to? I mean, I didn't even tell anyone what I was going through because yeah. I live in Texas. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, y yoga center in Texas. Well, how did this start? It must be a God thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was an amazing experience, um, but I don't recommend doing it that way. Um, if you want to work with your kundalini, then doing small amounts of meditation, joining a kundalini yoga class, um, prayer, deep prayer um, can take you there. But you want to do it slowly and gently. I ju it just triggered. I didn't know what I was doing. It just happened because I was doing the mantra, which 
it gave me a deep and profound respect for the technology. Well, what is the mantra, if you don't mind sharing? Um, it's called the Gayatri Mantra, and it's Um Bur Bhuvas Faha Tat Savitur Varinyam Bargo Deva Shadimahi De Yoyona Prachodayad. And it's on YouTube. Um, but anyone that chants it, they need to approach it with caution and yeah. respect and start very, very slowly. Um, I mean, I wish I'd have known. It would have changed my life because before, before the Kundalini event, I did healing. I did lots of work in the psychic world, but I was a heavy smoker, mm -hmm. um, drank a lot of coffee, a real <laughs> type A person, and it changed who I was at a very fundamental level. Now I run a yoga studio. That would have never happened. That's, that's interesting. Um, let's uh, unpack this a little bit too, because there's so much just even in that, setting that up. Uh, the voices that you were hearing early on, and when you're, you know, if you don't have nobody telling you what they are, hey, this is gonna come, don't be scared, it's natural, you're gonna begin to hear these things, you're gonna see visions, dream dreams, those type of things. It's, when you have a yogi or a teacher helping you, it becomes a lot more easier, but when all of this stuff starts happening spontaneously, like it did for you, it becomes scary. I think I'm losing my mind. What did mm -hmm. I do? I need help. Do I call a doctor? Do I call a priest? You know, we need somebody to talk to. And there's a lot of people out there experiencing similar things. The voices early on, did they come out to be the voice of the yogi that was communicating with you, the voice of the angels, or a little bit of all of it? How did you kind of uh, come to grips with understanding how to hear those voices, especially when they were speaking in different languages? Well, I've always been clairaudient, and that's one of the things that helps me help people that I work with in my healing sessions. Um, I mean, I hear things very, very clearly, and that's my strongest psychic skill as a healer is the clear audience that comes through. So I'd heard voices, but when it first started, um, the, I come from a background where there was a lot of abuse um, in my childhood. And the voices I heard initially that were so terrifying were the voices of my, my stepfather, of my mother, of other people at whose hands I had suffered. So it was like it was clearing all of that out of my body. And finally, that went away. And then the other changes, the, the beautiful things came, like talking with the angels. And, you know, they told me who they were. They told me how big they were. They, they just told me all kinds of things. And, you know, I got the feeling they're pretty dang lonely, that folks just aren't calling on them anymore, don't believe in them the way they used to. But then... Um, I watched the city of angels and I told my husband, I said, Oh my God, that's what they told me. Oh my God. That's what they said. Oh my God. That's, you know, I was like, just in shock at, I think whoever wrote that movie yeah. has had an angel experience. I oh, really, yeah. yeah. So it was like that. And the things that they would tell me that were in other languages, I could understand when I was in that place. Cause I wasn't asleep and I wasn't awake. Um, so uh, I, I, they just told me all kinds of things about animals, about people, about medicine. Yeah. That's interesting, the fact that you watched that particular movie and it was like the embodiment of your spiritual experience. It absolutely was. We've all had those encounters okay. and for some reason we watched the right movies. Like mm -hmm. early on my experience, I was watching tons of movies and uh, it was it was like the embodiment of what I was experiencing and I would write them down. And, and, you know, early on I was doing a lot of research and stuff and trying to find someone else articulating what I was experiencing and I would see it in the movies and uh, I would actually take the clips and put it in my music and I would take the little video samples and of the angels showing up and Hey, this is who we are and this is how we communicate. And I'm like, what the hell? Somebody put that in the, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In the um, movies and stuff. And so I come, I, I try to, you know, get to the bottom of it. And I, and I wonder, uh, it's probably a little bit of both, but like with, with Hollywood and those guys, like, do they, have they had those experiences? Do they know the secrets of the lost arts? Do they know the secrets of the Bhagavad Gita and the book of Enoch and all those hidden stories in the Bible and stuff like that? 
because it's all within the movies. So I'm, I'm wondering if the writers and producers know about it and they want to get it out there. So they do it through art, just like we do it. We create art. We get, get those experiences out. Or is it the universe, God and the angels who are like, I'm going to get this information out any way that I can. And they, they don't even know what they're writing, but I'm giving it to them. Does that make sense? Do you, would you say, do you think it's probably both? (laughs) I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I think some people are more of a natural channel and creatives in particular, they're not afraid to open up their minds. And when your mind is open, it's a lot easier for spirit to channel through. Um, I love the Pentecostal churches when I go in there. Yeah, they are so. That's what I come out of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They are so awesome because people go in there and they drop their mask. They drop, you know, and they just become, they just be. And you see spirit moving through them and speaking in tongues is an action of spirit. It's a, it's considered a blessing. Um, One of my stepdaughters is Pentecostal. And I went to a lot of the Pentecostal churches when I was a teenager, because you can feel the spirit moving through the congregation Mm. and you can see it. Okay. So I think that when you do meditation, um, the voices or the beings that are always right beside us actually get a chance to speak up instead of when we're hurrying and we're rushing, we kind of shut them out Mm -hmm. because we're on a different uh, wavelength. Yeah. But in, in Hollywood, that's what they do. Um, They open up to be creative. They open up and the angels say, Oh, yay. Look Mm -hmm. a clear channel. Yeah, that's good. Um, Well, let me ask you this. So I've been doing a lot of work and, and putting my head out there trying to, you talk about the pranayama, the Kundalini, um, the chi energy, and last but not least, the Holy Spirit and how, mm-hmm. the you know, this life essence that animates all flesh, it's in the air that we breathe, it, it gives us life and it's the Ruach in the Bible and it's the breath of God or the Holy Spirit, the creative force. When you're in those um, Pentecostal services and you can feel the Holy Spirit moving through there, you feel that essence, the life force that, hey, these people are tapped in. Is it the same thing as th- that you experienced through Kundalini Yoga? Because for me, it was. And I'm trying to yes. articulate that to people. But people are like, no, it's not the same. I think it is. It was, it your is experience the same. Is the same? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is the same. And if you look throughout all cultures, like when you see African dance, you'll see them bouncing and jumping. And then they start. It's the same look. Yeah. If you look at their faces, you see it's the Holy Spirit. It's the divine spark within. You've let it out. You've let go of the mind. You've let go of the idea of who you are. You. That's what coming into being means. You just let go of all of these crystallized ideas. And we need our ego. I am not one of these people who says, oh, we got to get rid of the ego, (laughs) but the ego has to be in the right place. And when it's in the right place and you're working deliberately through spirit, through services or meditation or deep prayer, it rises and it talks about it. My husband is the Bible man. He can quote it back and forth. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't believe he studied it um, in college and I need to have was him raised. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I'll have to have him talk to you too, because he, he and I talk all the time about how the Eastern philosophy, um, segues and fits perfectly into, yeah. um, the Western philosophy of spirituality. If you know what to look for and yeah. if you understand the language. Yeah. Yeah. Christianity has evolved into something very much different than what it started out as. And I think the true followers who have the spirit can sense that they read the scriptures. They these ecstatic, glorious encounters with angels and hearing God speak to you, being influenced by the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit come through and cleanse out and clean, clean out all the bad stuff that you've done. Those traumatic experiences, much like you encountered through the Kundalini. It came through and fixed your trauma, cleaned you up, repaired your DNA. Like people are still having those encounters and that's where the beauty is. And so, you know, Western religion, a lot of them, it's more uh, analytical now and matter of fact versus having this spiritual encounter. But the beautiful thing about Christianity, it was a spiritual practice that started in the East 
as it comes to the West, it becomes more of a religion. But praise God, there are those Pentecostal churches and there are those people who still uh, ke- uh, fan the flame of that divine spark that was given to them since the beginning. And that's beautiful and it can be experienced by all people groups. But let me ask you this, because we're talking about Hollywood and we're talking about the angels and, and the beauty of, of movies and things like that. We're talking about Christianity and the beauty of it, the Kundalini, the beauty of it. There's bad sides to all this. There's evil there stuff is. that's going on in Hollywood. There's evil stuff going on in the Catholic Church and many other churches who have rejected the spirit. Um, and even in the Kundalini circles, if you don't balance the energy, you can it can be dangerous. And the same is to be said with the Holy Spirit. If you lie to the Holy Spirit, the Bible says Ananias and Sapphira, they were killed on the spot. They tried mm-hmm. to lie to that spirit. And um, so you have to you have to count the cost. You can't put your hand to the plow and turn back, as the Bible says. What are some of the consequences? Because it is fun. It's glorious. It will change your life. All of it will. Everything we mentioned. Um, but you have to be careful. You you don't go into it half-heartedly, half-stepping. Um, you caught it really early without having a lot of, hey, do this, don't do that. So you had to kind of learn on your own. What are some of the dangers of it? And it's something that would let you know that it's not anything to play with, but it is to be respected, reverenced, and uh, and it's holy, really. It is. It's very holy. Uh, The first thing is get a teacher. (laughs) Work with the teacher if you can. Don't try to do this on your own. The Literature, Eastern literature is riddled with um, references to meditator's disease, which is a spontaneous kundalini rising. Um, It burns up the nervous system. And that's why you start feeling the tingling. And when I was deep into it, I mean, I was like spasming. I didn't tell anyone what was happening to me because I I had two kids. I thought, oh, my God, they're going to think I'm insane and they're going to take my children away. And um at the, when I did start going to the Kundalini yoga classes, all of that calmed down because it brought the prana under control because when the Kundalini comes up, the prana in the body, is like sticking your fist into an electrical box. I mean, that's how high the nervous system begins to operate at. And if you haven't done your pre-cleansing work, it can kill you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and pe- people try to make a difference and say that the, the the Holy Spirit won't kill you. Yes, it will. Yes, There's it people will. who are mad right now. They are in they have they need help, psychiatric help, because they have received the baptism and infilling of the Holy Spirit, but did not count the cost. They did right. not do the spiritual work. And they in, a, in on the mental plane, they are in very a very bad place. Um when you felt the, you know, what is called the Kriyas and the, the jerks and, and volts of energy, a lot of people uh, say that it, 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 like the jerking and stuff hurt or the energy hurt. For me, and in, 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 in coming from the Christian tradition, uh, I, we experienced the jerks. I mean, we would, there would be times where we would just be so high in the spirit that it would last for days. Mm-hmm. And we would just be in mid conversation and, start jerking i mean the guy who led me to the lord years ago if you have a conversation with him and you and you say trigger words he'll oh oh hey oh and he'll yeah the energy jerk, starts moving back again. Will move it does i don't think it hurts him though because there's like this euphoria that's released with it and it's like a cleansing and it feels good um did you experience like the release of this beautiful energy like mm, this is what you need let me give you a little bit of healing that you need in this area mid day, mid sentence when you're not prepared for it. How did that work? And what's the contrast of it hurting versus being something euphoric and feeling good? When I was going through the initial stages of it, when the jerking, the spasming was so strong, um, it didn't hurt per se. Sometimes my back, I would go all the way back. To where I, and I am, I can't do that now. And I've been a yoga teacher for 22 years, but my head would, my crown would go all the way back and touch the ground when that Kundalini was coming up. So it was like a wild fire, the intensity of it. um, I felt so alive, right? When that was happening. But with the the jerking, um, 
it scared me because it was so intense, but it, it didn't hurt. I mean, sometimes I'd start out in a chair and I'd do the chanting, the energy would begin to rise, the jerking mm -hmm. would happen. I mean, I would jerk right out of the chair and I would, I would chant until the jerking stopped, but the jerking itself never hurt falling out of the chair yeah. did sometimes. Um, but now the Kundalini, because I have a regular Kundalini yoga practice and I teach it at my studio. Sometimes when I'm meditating, I'll get, I call it the Kundalini wag or when I'm doing uh, healing, my head will wag, start wagging a little yeah. bit. And I'm oh, like, yeah. all right, it's on the move. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Kundalini yeah. is on the move. I'm wagging, but it's, I don't do the jerking anymore. Um, it's just mainly it's that more under control. Like can, you, you can feel, feel it, it in the back of my neck. You can feel it and control it. Mm -hmm. like it's powerful but you can you can keep it under wraps yeah um with a lot of that weird stuff as far as like people sp like jerking and spinning and like i said being a part of the charismatic movements and things like that the blessings and outpouring brownsville revival those type of things which i came out of um you know the head shirking is a thing where they start mm -hmm. you know there's there's uh, different uh, preachers and evangelists who once they start pr praying or prophesying they'll start shaking her head they know it'll the violently it'll violently go just, uh, uh, shake it I, I knew a lot of people who did that i mean i've done it a little bit there's people there's a guy named lou engel when he prays he uh, rocks he back just, and he forth just declares and he just gets in this motion and so when you look at in, in eastern tradition some of the different practices that you would do in kundalini yoga sit around and doing the spinning or you know doing the head back and forth as well like it raises that energy and it's it's the same thing for those who have an ear, let them hear. But some people who, you know, sit back in judgment, they try to say, oh, it's different. That's not what we do. And in essence, yes, it is. It's the same. That's thing. what it feels you like. Know? It's, it's the exact same happens. thing. So they say, well, I don't shake my head like that. <laughs> not everybody does. Come on. You know, it's different strokes for different folks. When you feel that energy, you do different things. I know. I mean, we've been in meetings where the whole play the whole room would be on their faces like just crying and bawling and grieving but it was a beauty of like refreshing wind that comes through the place and and you can have like that encounter in a whole group of people and then have that same encounter by yourself doing the meditations and the chantings and the prayers and the static euphoria that comes through and it's a cleansing fire like you said it's beautiful i love it um I, I wouldn't do it without it. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be here without that. It's awesome. It, it That actually took my drug addiction away, you know, because like um, it was like a trading of one for the other. It was a euphoria, like a high that would come that was like no other drug, no other, you know, alcohol or anything could 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 measure up to the beauty that was in the Holy Spirit and in that that environment. And so it and I still I'm still like addicted to it and I love it and it still cleanses me and but it's it can go at as far as a big group a meeting of people but just exploring it uh, as close as your next breath taking that breath and going on that journey within or cleansing out as well so it's so beautiful um some of the um the, the kundalini practices like what like if someone was new to it and was just coming to a class, what would be some of the techniques that you would teach them to do just starting out the Kundalini yoga? Cause there's some beautiful ones and it's Kundalini yoga is, is so different than regular yoga. I mean, yes. I know people who are yoga teachers who can't stand Kundalini yoga. They right. don't like it, what it does to the body. I don't think it's healthy. It's got, it's probably hurts your body, your spine, all of this kind of stuff. I love Kundalini yoga. It's beautiful. But um, what would be some of the things, because, I mean, there's probably people listening who have no idea what it is. So some of the different practices or bodily motions that you would do to kind of rise that energy up for a beginner. Okay, so for a beginner, whenever they come in, one of the fundamental aspects of Kundalini that makes it so different than most of the other yogas is its emphasis on pranayama or breathing techniques. We have so, so many breathing techniques that we use in the tradition and one that is used throughout the classes is called breath of fire. Yes. So before you can even do breath of fire, you have to learn how to do slow, deep breathing. Yes. So, um, you know, if you're going to uh, take up this practice, get a teacher because breath of fire moves energy really fast. And as a note of warning, um, if 
when you do drugs or alcohol or over sexting, you affect the nervous system, the Kundalini. And like for me, I was abused. So kids who are abused, they don't have the myelin sheath that doesn't build on the nervous system the way it does when people don't come from traumatic circumstances. Um, so the prana travels a lot faster for people like us, people who have had drug addictions or people who have been in abusive situations. So if you're going to do kundalini yoga, please get a teacher. Um, but with breath of fire, once you learn the slow deep breathing, which is the first thing that you teach, you inhale through the nose. As you inhale, you feel the lungs expand, the rib cage expand, and the diaphragm lifts. On the exhale, again, out through the nose, you push the navel back towards the spine. And so there's a brief pause at the top of the inhale and a brief pause at the exhale. Once you get that, you can begin to use the breath of fire, which moves the energy in the body very quickly. It also purifies the nervous system. It brings the brain to a state of alertness and it purifies the blood. Um, and so what breath of fire is, is you inhale in through the nose and then you snap the navel back. And that's where I start people who are beginners. When you really begin to learn how to work with the navel and the breath, then you pick the speed up to where it's um, going very, very fast. But in the beginning, you just inhale, snap the navel back. And just do that breath for about two to three minutes. And you'll feel the effects right away. What about um, some of the different bodily movements? Like I was saying, the head moving back and forth or rolling the the um uh, the Sufi guess, grind yeah the yeah the, yeah the grinding which is really interesting especially when we talk about movies because uh, you know a lot of this was was released in the movie Avatar with mm -hmm. the the uh, the uh, blue beings or whatever the blue avatars they were all at the tree of life worshiping and they're all doing the bodily motion I'm like man and that that movie did something to people when they watched it. So there's some of those techniques were released in that, but do you guys practice that at all? Yes. Uh, we start every session with a Sufi grind as a part of the movement. And the way you work with that, it's not like an around the world where you take the whole body around. Mm -hmm. You actually, it's like a belly dancing movement. Um, so you're rotating the spine around. And so that begins to move that energy up the spine. And it also purifies the digestive system. So when you begin to do that movement in Kundalini yoga, we work with the energies in the lower chakras. So the sexual energy with the idea, you bring that energy up and then you do something that's called a root lock or mole bond. And you lift up on the anal sphincter, the pelvic floor muscles, and you pull in the navel and you tighten so say you did a Sufi grind 11 times in one direction, then 11 times in the other. Then at the end of the exercise, you'd inhale deep, and then you'd apply what's called root lock. You'd lift up on the anal sphincter, pelvic floor, pull in on the navel. These are ancient techniques for raising the kundalini, and move, which resides at the very base of the spine, yeah. to move it up through the central channel called the sushumna. Um, to take it all the way up so that it goes up to the pineal gland in the brain where it goes ding and the pineal gland vibrates and wakes up and helps you live your life with more clarity, more focus and more spirituality. Um, dealing with those um, uh, animalistic natures, you know, the primordial nature that we have dealing with the root chakra. Um, you mentioned, um, people who are like over um, active sexually, whether mm -hmm. they're having intercourse with, with a lot of people or they're addicted to pornography, whatever the case is, doing some stuff like that of, of, of bringing that energy into submission through the root chakra, would that help them overcome this, this need to just always release whatever, yes. whatever the case is? Because there's a lot of people out there dealing with that. And it's not good for you creatively, spiritually, to just right. always be doing that. So would some of these techniques help for somebody who needs to, ha to have that under control versus having it controlling them? Absolutely. And um, another thing that happens is when you have a, a very strong sex drive, you can move through 
spiritual life even more quickly because that kundalini is already awake. It's just sitting down there roaring in that first and second chakra saying, let me out, let me out. And the only way people know how to do it is through sexting. Yeah. Um, so once you begin to work with those energies and bringing them up to a higher level, I mean, you can feel it travel the spine and you can feel it open the heart, open the throat, open the third eye, open your connection to God, to the universe, to all the subtle energies that exist in front of us, behind us, above us, below us, and on each side of us. You begin, your level of sensitivity is greatly increased. And so, yeah, you you take that raw sexual energy, that primal force, and you move it up through the chakras and you become illuminated. Yeah. I really think that, you know, this, these spiritual practices that we're talking about are, are were, were definitely embraced by the early church and, you know, Eastern spirituality. Um, and it talks about whenever um, you're fasting to abstain from sex, to be able to, because ha- you need the energy and people's always releasing that energy and they're always depleted of that, that energy or that drive, you know? Um, so when, whenever um, someone is doing these spiritual practices and the Bible talks about walking in the spirit, which really means having a lifestyle where you engage spirituality, you're walking daily in the spirit connected. And, and one of the fruits or the essences of walking in the spirit is self-control, being able to control oneself in what aspect, every aspect, not easily angered, not jumping to conclusions, not getting into Facebook debates like that. That's some self-control sexually being able to control yourself, you know, not getting flustered, not always looking for that easy release, that quick release. So walking in, in the spirit, one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. So maintaining a spiritual practice is going to help you to be able to control all of your desires, especially early on with the uh, root chakra dealing with the sexual energies and stuff too, which is very important to, uh, to have that under control, especially doing anything spiritual. Cause that's going to, that's going to, if you don't, it's going to take your drive away. I mean, I know there's people all, all over and even in the comment, people are saying, thank you for addressing this, but it's going to take your drive to do anything spiritual or productive, you know? Yeah. In the Kundalini tradition, they actually, I've studied Ayurveda. I'm an Ayurvedic practitioner as well. And they, that's the sister to yoga. They actually, based on your nervous system, give you, the number of times you should have sex based on your nervous system. And for men in particular, uh, ejaculation hits the nervous system and it weakens it. That's why warriors didn't have sex before they went out because it weakens the nervous system. You lose your edge. Um, And that's true spiritually too. If you don't um, use sexuality, as a nourishment to your spiritual practice, then it's a detriment to you as a human being. Um, so moderation in all things and yeah. a sex, a wisely practiced sex life is the best kind of sex life. It's mm-hmm. the, the joy of it is so much better when you're with someone you love, you're, you're not doing it just to do it or to run away. People use it like food. They use it to escape the misery or the suffering that is going on for them or inside shopping, of themselves. Any type of addiction. Shopping. Yeah. It's all, or alcohol or drugs. Yeah. It's all the same thing. It's all, all of that turns you, like you were just saying, it turns you away from spirit. Yeah. Um, in Kundalini yoga, you know, because there's a lot in the Bible about men masturbating and, you know, that being seen as not a good thing for fellas to do. Um, in Kundalini Yoga, it said everyone has an arc line that goes from ear to ear, but only women have an arc line that goes from nipple to nipple. So when a man is with a woman in intercourse, that arc line uh, that goes from nipple to nipple protects his nervous system. It helps him not overtax it. So, yeah. I mean, nature is so wise, right? It's um, so wise. We're getting some some um, comments wanting to ask you about uh, Tantra. And um, some of that to me is it c- can be weird, especially when it's uh, involved with big groups of people and having like really it gets really strange. I think it's beautiful practice with your spouse, your 
you know, your, your significant other and, and exploring that a little bit. But do you have any comments when it comes to, uh, you know, tantric yoga or that type of energy? I know we're, we're talking about it essentially with this, but do you practice that? Do you believe in it as a, as a philosophy that you believe in or, um, Cause I it, we I had someone on and it and I in looking at videos and pictures it's like, it's really strange. So do you have any do you have a um a comment about that, an opinion? Well, I have a I have a lot of opinions about tantra, which is um, until you are a hundred percent spiritually pure, tantra has a tendency to degrade into hedonism, and they are very different things. Um, Tantra as practiced in the East is very different than what is called Tantra here in the States. I personally, the Tantra I do is white Tantra, which is Kundalini yoga, which is I work with the sexual energy in my body with mm -hmm. myself to bring it up through uh, my chakras rather than trying to do it through sexual relationship. Um, you know, the sexual relationship I have with my husband is beautiful, is connected, it's joyous, but we don't use um, tantric practices because I really do think that it's, it's a dangerous and misleading path for many people. Um, you know, I'm not a prude and there's lots of different ways to get to God, right? And so maybe for some people, I tell people that like when you first have your first kundalini experience or you first have that experience where you let go of the self, the closest thing I can describe it as is like an orgasm. When a person has an orgasm, there's that space where you are nothing but pure bliss, right? Yeah. Um, but that's your starting point. That's not your finish point. Once you've experienced the beauty of an orgasm where I feel like you're completely connected to God, learning to do that outside of the bedroom through spiritual practices that have been practiced for centuries is the best way to approach your spiritual development while still having a deep, committed, and loving relationship with your partner, your spouse. I agree. We see eye to eye, eye, to eye on that. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, I was on your website and you have some stuff on there about um, an earthing mat and uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about grounding a little bit and specifically in earthing mat because synchronistically I just bought one yesterday. <laughs> I just ordered, placed an order for one to have here at my desk and uh, do you have any experience with grounding in general and then maybe the earthing mat and stuff like that? Yes. Uh, well, with grounding, if you are someone who's lucky enough to be able to get outside and walk with your bare feet on the earth and be in the sun, of course, that's the best way to do it. But a lot of us, you know, our jobs keep us inside or for reasons that we don't control, we're inside most of the time. Um, so a grounding mat is awesome. I have loved mine and I can feel the energy of it. Um, it's best. I got the one that's full body length and you can also get sheets and things like that. But do you really... use it as a yoga mat as well? Or you just, mm -mm. no, no I just lay on it and uh, it's best to be unclothed when you're laying on it because that's the energy doesn't travel nearly as well through the, the clothing. Um, but I can feel a distinct difference when I use it as versus when I don't use it. I love mine and it's, you know, it's like 65 or $70. Yeah. I can't remember how much I paid for mine. So while it's a little bit pricey, it's not over the top. And yeah. I use mine all of the time. Yeah, I was reading some of the comments and stuff. People were saying that it helps them sleep better, helps them focus better, um, things like that, and just feel better in their body. I had a rough day yesterday. My sinuses went crazy. And I was like, man, I got to have something. And I felt a need to get out there and put my feet on the ground. And so I was like, well, I'm always here at the computer. I'm always working. So I ordered one to actually, you plug it into the grounding outlet of, of your, your plug, like a, you know what I'm saying, in the wall, which is, all, which is usually um, a rod that goes in the ground and it's a wire fed into your electrical system in your house. So you plug it in the plug there and, uh, and you can ground it. You can actually test them as well. So that was interesting that I've seen that on your website and I placed an order yesterday for one. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting mine in. There was a, there was a lyric too, from a song I posted by, um, uh, the band, uh, perfect circle, but this is what they said. 
and that's kind of what led me to do it. But it says, uh, time to put the silicone obsession down, take a look around, and find a way in the silence. Lie su- su- uh, supine away with your back to the ground. Dis and reconnect to the resonance now. You were never an island. And the guy who, who wrote that song, there was a tour of his house, and he actually has this, like, uh, um, indention in, in the ground that he lays in. Like, he'll, he hit, it's like a, there's a, pyramid above it that he built so he lies in the ground with the the um, p- um copper pyramid over it believing in the pyramid energy and um and, and actually grounding that way lying face down i mean face up with your back to the ground and just the power of grounding and um and we need to do it you know we you know even people who go outside you know we know the sun feeds us uh energy and uh you know what i'm saying nutrients and the food that we eat it's when we partake of that life energy it's from the sun or whatever uh, even when we walk outside but you know most of us don't put our feet on the ground we have rubber soles on our shoes and and all the, all that kind of stuff so we don't really get to partake of that energy so uh very important there's a lot of documentary there's a lot of people who vouch for it i think even dr oz had some stuff talking about grounding in the earth energy so something people should look into um we talk about healing as well, spiritual healing. Um, and I've heard you in other interviews talk about how like a lot of times we go through the, we have these physical ailments that happen to our bodies. And um, a lot of times that it could be caused through things that are out of whack spiritually. Do you believe in that, that we could be spiritually out of line and maybe open ourselves up in certain areas for dis-ease um, spiritually? as well as physically as well, that turns into something physical? Oh, absolutely. I think that when it's like I've told my daughter before, spirit first gently goes knock, knock. And you're like, "Eh, I'm not going to answer that door. Then it goes knock, knock. Nah, don't feel like it. Then it goes knock, 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 knock. And you're sick. Something comes up because in our north, we're taught to push through things. We're not taught to listen to our intuition or to pay attention to things that are happening to us. We're, you know, we're taught to be machines, just push through it, you know. And then the next thing we know, we've got cancer. Of course, you know, a lot of the disease, the cancer in particular is a disease whose numbers just continue to rise. And if you think about what cancer is, um, and you put kind of a spiritual or more holistic um, trapping over it. It's something that invades the body at all levels. It creates great suffering. It disrupts everything. So I think for me that all disease begins first in the emotional slash spiritual body, that something goes out of whack there. And that's when spirit's going knock, knock. And then you start feeling bad, you start acting out, you start doing bad things. um, Because good people do bad things. And a lot of times they don't even know why they're doing them. And it's that misalignment with spirits, something Mm -hmm. is out of whack. And then it doesn't get caught and then boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden you've got cancer. Well, now it's got your attention, but you have a disease. Um, So when I work with people, when they come to me, I work pretty intensively on the spiritual causes of disease, not only the physical, but the spiritual. Um, Let's go back to, you know, let's start with, you know, where you first became unhappy in your life, what happened. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we talked through that and in Kundalini yoga, there's body work for getting rid of old and lodged memories that uh, sit in the body and then create disease. Um, shaking, which again, you see in a lot of indigenous traditions, which you see in the Pentecostal churches, people will shake. Yeah. Well, in Kundalini, we're taught that what that shaking does is it realigns the nervous system and it literally shakes out old memories because we're like a record. Everything that's ever happened to us is scribed. And in some places, the record goes scratch all the way across. And mm. that's what you call a block. Yeah. Shaking out allows the nervous system to 
re-strength and reassemble itself, become stronger, let go of old memories. Um, and you see that in a lot of different traditions. So when I work with people, we always work with the spiritual and the emotional as well as the physical. You can't separate them. Yeah, there's some there's something there, and uh, I, I was I'm gonna talk about this just to mention it. Um, uh, you know, we're talking about the sexual energy and stuff, and there's a lot of people who deal with that. I've been getting a lot of messages lately, people wanting help, how to overcome that, and different ways to do that. And people want to be free from that, and they feel like they're controlled by their sexual energy, and it's a, a you know, what I'm saying it's a it's addicting. It's not you can't just turn it off. I do think that you have to turn off some of that stuff by actually starving it out. You know what I'm saying? Quit feeding it. But talking about the the link there, there was this weird encounter I had some years ago um, when I was addicted to um, internet pornography. And um, you always feel like it has control over you. And it changes the way that you you view people, you view women. Um, even like it's a weird control that you you have to bring every thought captive and to be able to do that it's it's very hard but there was an experience i had years ago where i was addicted to internet porn i was looking at some porn and um my dog was um behind me and um uh, he had been neutered he doesn't even have like the organs to want to do that and he was humping the uh, mm -hmm. a, a stuffed animal has never done that and he's been neutered for years and I, and I was like I got I felt it like you can feel the essence like oh so, this isn't like there's something else here that's got control of me you know and, and so you, you have to bring every thought captive and to submit yourself to that man people want to be free and I really believe that it's healthy to engage in um spiritual practice to engage in aligning the chakras searching your heart what is it like what am i trying to usually when 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 you do the research and you look up men who are addicted to pornography or, or sex or whatever it's usually people have been through tr traumatic experiences as kids they had a, a rough upbringing they had a parent who wasn't there that those type of things and uh and it's about this instant uh gratification about not working for it and so the more study and research we do we find out that any instant gratification is bad that you have to work to release that dopamine you have to work to achieve something um a healthy sexual relationship you have to work for it um, a healthy marriage takes work a healthy career you have to work your butt off you know what i'm saying so uh anything instant gratification taking drugs uh people on ecstasy mdma an instant release of all of this um uh, you know what i'm saying pleasure instant pleasure by taking a pill well guess what's going to happen the next day you're going to feel like a zombie you're going to feel depleted your emotions are going to be out of whack you're cheating you're not supposed to do that you have to work for all of this stuff and so it was really through the work of manly p hall who really brought that out um and help me know that because I feel like everybody deserves a happy life. Like it's free, mm -hmm. just claim it, you know, whatever. But yeah, you could do that, but you have to work for it. You have to work to maintain it. Like once you get it, any of us can get it, but once you get it, how do you maintain it and walk in it and cultivate it? And I really believe that it is walking in the spirit and that is the spiritual practice that we're talking about. Kundalini yoga, breath work, and that just lead earthing, good music like all of it just leads to this lifestyle of walking in the spirit and really when the bible talks about walking in the spirit the word used there uh the greek word means a cadence to to walk when to be to be following the wind of the holy spirit when it says go here go here when go there go there and being led by the spirit of god so versus being led by your earthly desires or your instant gratifications and uh, I'm telling you, achieving your dreams, walking in holiness, going to the next levels, and you have these visions for yourself. You have to deal with that, that you know what I'm saying, low-level stuff first. For for doors to, to open and walk in success and purity and wanting to be a healer, a lot of people want to be healers, you have to deal with that stuff. And so everything that we're talking about is is uh, should be applied. And uh, I, don't, I, I think that everything, like you're saying, 
um, that we do in in the um, spiritual um, reality takes place in the physical plane as well. Vice versa. Everything that we do physically has some type of effect in the ether, in the spirit realm as well. So every single thing, every movie, every song that we listen to, every thought that we think, that's why we have to take all of this stuff into captivity and, uh, and wonder why uh, this stuff keeps coming on. And so when it comes to those, the spirit realm, there's a terminology we use of like giving legal ground for those energies or entities to be there by the things that we're entertaining in our daily lives. And then when we cross over into the realm through meditation, through prayer, through whatever it means that we get into Kundalini Yoga, we have to deal with that stuff early on because it can't stay with you going ascending into the higher levels. That stuff holds on to you. It won't allow you to ascend, but it's good. It's a learning experience. People are commenting in the chat that they just keep falling and falling and falling. They can't overcome with these urges and temptations, but it is a learning experience. You know what it feels like to be at rock bottom. So... You know, you got to have that contrast there. So all of this stuff kind of works to serve us and to really build up an empathy within us. I believe a natural empathy that we want to help people who is who have been through similar experiences as of who have been bound by pill addiction, bound by pornography addiction or whatever the case is or in uh, abusive relationships. You want to help those people. Breast cancer. Like you have this natural fight. Your book that you wrote is talking about fighting it, not just, you know, being aware, but actually, you know, being on the offense and protecting yourself. And some of these ways that you're talking about uh, can help uh, people prevent breast cancer or any any type of cancer, really. Um, my wife is really she's got a lot of friends who who have come down with um, breast cancer and one of the things that is really on her heart was to look into the effects of, and it's usually, uh, it has to, to deal with their armpits and the type of um, deodorant that they're using. And it has uh, heavy aluminums in it that prevents their body from releasing toxins through those glands. And so using the the different deodorants or whatever, have you looked into that at all as being something that could cause cancer? So your body is not like it's closing, almost closing off the pores so that you can't get those toxins out through sweating it out, which is how we release all types of bad stuff within our bodies. Uh, I talk about all of that in my book and more, and I recommend, you know, they haven't proven a definitive link between, uh, yeah, as, Antiperspirants are the the top culprit because they do they stop you from um, sweating, and you know I talk in the in my book about how you know we were meant to sweat it's part of the human uh, culture but yeah a lot of breast cancer starts right up here in the top quadrant, and there's good reason to think that perhaps deodorants and antiperspirants might have a link to breast cancer. So what I recommend um, and what I have used for the last 40 years, there's a crystal rock salt. You just wet it and you wipe it under your arms. And, you know, if you're having a heavy workout day or something like that, just put a little soap and water underneath your arms and then reapply the, the little, it's easy to carry around the little salt rock and you do not have an odor. You don't stink. Um, so, and that's perfectly natural and you are going to sweat uh, and which is what you need to do. And also people don't realize um, perfumes are endocrine disruptors. They do all kinds of horrible things to the endocrine system and should not be used. I mean, there's, my book is very heavily research-based. So I back up everything I say with research and I provide that research to the readers to, they can follow the links, go out and look at the studies that I'm using to talk about that. I talk about the grounding mat. I talk about the acupressure mat, yoga, sweat lodges. I mean, I've got something like 65 pages on alternative yeah. therapies. So what, so, so what is some of the, uh, the uh, positive effects of the uh, acupuncture mat or whatever it's called? Cause I've actually got one. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, when I got mine, there were none in the United States. Mm -hmm. I'd had sciatica and I couldn't get rid of it. I'd done um, acupuncture uh, in all my yoga practices, but um, I was working as a project manager at the time. So I was always racing through airports in high heels. 
and I just couldn't get the sciatic nerve well. And I told my husband, I said, well, I found this thing in India. It's called an, a bed of nails mm-hmm. and it's $108, but I'm going to order it and I may wind up just throwing it away, but I was desperate. So I ordered it, it came and you lay on it with no clothing, right? So I put it across uh, lengthwise and put my bum directly on it and ooh, it stung like I'd sat down in a nest of bees. <laughs> Um, but within two weeks, the sciatica, which I had had for something like um, almost two years and couldn't get rid of, it was gone. I lay on mine all of the time. I go to sleep on it. I can lay on it on any part of my body. And what it does is it you lay on it and at first it stings. I mean, no joke, it stings. But then all the circulation in the body begins to change and the body goes, Oh, injury. So all the endorphins just start hammering the blood and you get totally blissed out. I mean, I wake up four or five hours um, later, having gone to sleep on it. I've saved marriages with it. Um, I had a lady come in, her husband was 74 and he'd hurt his back. We sold them. We bought them from China and we sold them for a long time at the studio until they became common on the uh, internet and we stopped selling them. But her husband had been a very virile and active man. And he had hurt his back when he was doing um, some roofing work. And she was complaining because he couldn't do his manly duties anymore. (laughs) And he was like, he came in there and he's like, ah, this is a stupid damn idea. This is never going to work. Yada, yada, yada. So they took it home. And a week and a half later, they came back and they bought 10 of them from us. They gave them to their children, to the people in the bingo club. So it is amazing for alleviating pain. It's amazing for alleviating emotional stress. It calms you down. It's really good for the ladies. Like when you're having PMS and you have all that bloating, you'll see your stomach shrink if you lay across it on your tummy. What about about the ones just for the feet? Do you get the same effect or similar effect the ones um, that you stand with, on? with the feet <laughs> when you first step on it go lightly because if you put all your weight down you're going to go wow yeah. <laughs> you feel it light up your entire body all the way up and down so yeah you definitely will feel it should you walk on it or just stand on it no just stand on it okay. you don't want to walk on it um and you the way i recommend people start using it on the feet is just you're sitting down and you put your feet on it and you slowly put pressure down on it and It'll it's great the bed or something maybe the massage therapist too you mm-hmm. can press your hands down if you have trouble with your wrist you can lean your weight into it and press your hands down and it'll get rid of a lot of the pain and tenderness that's in the wrist and i mean for like 19 bucks yeah, these things last forever yeah, my friend, um, he owns a um, um, sensory deprivation tank, and he mm-hmm. has a, a center in New Orleans, uh, and he come over and stayed with me. He left it over here, <laughs> so we've been using it. So I actually just found it the other day that we had it, he had it put up, but we've been using it, so it was cool, um, really cool. So something else about healing, um, sound healing, what, 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 what's some info you have about that? I love sound healing. It's very effective because it affects energy, not only on the subtle level, but on the physical level and and the spiritual level. Um, In Kundalini yoga, we use the gong. And again, I talk a lot about sound healing in my book. And um, it is said that uh, playing the gong or being um, in the presence of someone playing the gong helps repair damaged DNA. And I believe it. People have all kinds of experiences when um, they're subjected to uh, crystal bowls, to the gong. Um, I always mispronounce this word. I think it's binernal beats, B-I-N. Am I saying uh, it right? Binarial beats is how we pronounce it. Yeah, yeah, binarial beats. I always say it wrong. Um, I learned it the wrong way and now I can't get it out of my head. I have used the different fre- it's frequencies. It's all frequency based. I have used it for everything. Um, I, and I, the one I used it for the most was studying a memory when I was doing my degree in Ayurveda. And I found that it really boosted my retention. And usually, you know, a sound will distract me and I can't focus and concentrate. Boy, it made me 
laser sharp. It helped me so much. And I've used it for pain. I've used them for insomnia. And they're just different frequencies, which is the same thing that happens with the crystal bowls. Um, using the bowls, they'll have different frequencies. And so they'll work with different chakras and different organs. Um, tuning forks, awesome. Uh, again, it's just working with frequencies. We're all held together by frequencies. So we respond to them. Yeah, I put I put a lot of that stuff in my music. Like I'll tie it into the background. A lot of it I'll turn down just so the frequency is there, but you can't really hear it, I like to say, but you can feel it. Can't hear you it, can but you can it. feel it. We do that and have uh prayers and blessings and mantras all within the recordings just turned down as well. So as you're listening to it, you're like having a spiritual encounter because of the music, because of the lyrics that open you up to a higher knowledge and understanding. But then again, you have the different tones and frequencies that are being used that are opening you up to that as well. So just creating that, using sound and music to create a vortex, a portal for spiritual awakening and ascension, it's awesome. And then when you um, add vision to that, or you have talking about sound healing, but we add light healing or color healing, Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, adding aromatherapy, sound, mm -hmm. color or light and aromatherapy, those three senses, man. And, and if you know, if you could do the study and know what color does what and you have it all at the same time, it that just you're in heaven. You know, you're 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 going to leave your body <laughs> and you're going to be healed, man. There's there's sounds that you listen to just the sound of water. The sound of rain, it helps you be able to, to relax and go to sleep. My wife and daughter, they listen to it on their, what is that, um, the little talking Alexas or whatever the thing is. <laughs> they, you can tell it to play whatever sound you want. It'll instantly play it. So, uh, yeah, that stuff helps you. Um, tied into my music. What about um, what about Reiki healing? Because we're in, in, especially going back to the church, you know, we definitely pra practice the laying on of hands and putting your hands on different energy points in the body. Uh, the hands being uh, able to push and pull energy as well. Having that knowledge and information when you're laying on of hands or re re removing entities, negative spirits, bad energy off of people. If you're in tune, you can feel it. You can see it. And um you can speak to it like you can smell it like there's all types of ways that you can interact with this type of energy that's on people through what we would call faith healing and, or, and prayer and laying on of hands but it all goes in it has many names reiki healing i believe being one of them what's your experience with that well um my grandmother was a hands-on healer she did something that she called pulling pain and when i was about 12 she walked over and grabbed my hands she says you've got the hot hands and so she put me to work right away. But I mean, her method was simple. Wherever the pain was, she'd just get up over it and you'd just do circular and you'd pull it out. If you couldn't get it with the circular motion, you did uh, 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 counterclockwise and you would pull it out. It was that simple. And she would use visualizations to help people with disease. And I saw amazing things. So I never had any reason to doubt that it was real. You know, I didn't understand until I was quite a bit older. Other people didn't believe in it. I was like, what do you mean you don't believe in it? Have you ever tried it? And they're like, no. Well, I'm kind of hard to say you don't believe in it if you've never even tried it. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's a long tradition in every culture. I mean, every culture about the laying of hands. Um, Reiki is a laying of hands type modality. I've studied almost every system I can find. Reiki's one of them. I actually run a three weekend um, energy mastery course where I certify people do the level three Reiki master. Um, yeah. But we also go through all of the other types of energy healing, faith healing, yeah. uh, you know, all Someone's of that. Someone's mentioning tapping. They say tapping is, is amazing. Got to get the energy moving. What is, what is the practice of tapping? I know that's one I hear a lot about. It's called EFT emotional emotional freedom therapy i think is how what it is but i know it by eft and what you do is like you use affirmations like um i am beautiful i am free i am beautiful i am free and you tap different part parts of the body so that is a self-healing modality that anyone can learn and there's tons of uh uh 
YouTube videos about using EFT, the emotional freedom technique, yeah. Um, yeah. to kind of set yourself free from some of your blocks. And some people find it to be very therapeutic. Um, you know, with the laying on of hands, uh, people will say, well, do you heal yourself? Well, I'm like, yeah, I do. But if I've got something going on, I go find me one of my healers that I've trained that's got mega juju and I'm like, hit yeah. me with it. Sister. That's why you got, yeah. I mean, that's why you emphasize the, you know, the power and strength of community. We can't do that by ourselves a lot of times. You see, you know, mm -hmm. I had a, I was dealing with sinuses the other day. My friend's like, man, just heal yourself. I was like, okay. <laughs> it's like, like, like easier <laughs> said than done. But in the church, man, I remember we would, all, we would, we love laying on of hands. We love having that person. There were certain people who were better at it. Right. When they put when they put their hands on you, something is happening. But these are people who lived a lifestyle of consecration where mm -hmm. they prayed and meditated for like four hours straight every day or an hour a day. I knew people who at eight o'clock I'm going in my room, locking the door. I'm lighting candles. I'm going to meditate and talk to God like they did it every day, like clockwork. And But when they prayed and laid hands on people, things happen, healings and manifestations and stuff. So like, I wanted those people to pray for me. Like when I'm going through something or I need, I'm got, got a heaviness on me. And they would always say, they would always tell me there, you can do this too. You don't need us. And they would try to, you know, they, there were teachers trying to teach me to walk in it myself, which I am now. But back then it was like, no, we want you, you need to come over here. <laughs> Because we can do it. It may take longer, blah, blah, blah. But it's like people who carried what we were in the church would call the anointing or carried the fire. They understood, right? Um, but yeah, we, we look for people to, to pray for us. And you get addicted to that because there's a euphoria. There's an essence. People who know how to set the atmosphere for healing, you know, and we, we talk about that a lot. But um, when you don't have that or you don't have nobody to do that with you, it we're not, I, I, we're supposed to have community. Well, what's, what's the power there for community? I know that's a big one, which I just said, but you know, going through this awakening by yourself or not having anyone to talk to. I mean, that's why this podcast exists, you know, that you're going to, you know, people who are having these same encounters by themselves. Now they're not, don't think that they're crazy. You know, they're seeing UFOs. They're having, you know, visions and dreams of their ancestors coming to them, but they don't know who to talk to. You know, a lot of people are coming in and out of church and they're told that it's demonic. So we're just trying to set the atmosphere and let them know, look, this stuff is natural. It's OK. Many people have experienced it in the past and they're going to continue experiencing it. And it's very natural and it's something to harness and tap into. But um, and I know I'm covering a lot of it, but what would what would you add to that? That would be like just the power and why we need to have our tribe, as we say, or, or our community and simply to just do life with really. What's the power in that? Well, I don't see any reason why anyone should have to do anything by themselves. We are all one. I'm looking at you. You're an aspect of me. You're looking at me. I'm an aspect of you. We're all God's children, you know, and together we got the power, you know. So to me, numbers magnify your power. They don't detract from it. In India, you'll see people, man, they're all crammed together and they're just sitting there chanting and, you know, and in church, like again, and more in the Pentecostal, people are rolling around, they're rolling they're the all floor. over each other, <laughs> you know, it's like a puppy cuddle. Yeah. Um, and that builds energy, that creates energy, it magnifies energy. So yeah, I mean, I have a lot of healing energy and I'll direct it inwards and I'll work on doing it all by myself if I have to. But if I have a sister out there or a brother out there and they've got that healing power, well, now I got two of me to work on me. All it's going to do is maximize it or got three. Uh, you know, there have been times when we've done group healings with people. I've seen amazing things happen that people, you sometimes your energy will get low and you need that bump from someone who's not low and then you're all right with yourself. Yeah. Again. They can kind of pull you up to their level. Yeah. And having those friends in your life who can do that. It sucks to have a bunch of friends who can't do that. That's you right. Know? There's a, I know that there's a story in the Bible talking about Job's friends, right? And like, so Job was having a rough time. He's losing everything going through having this rough time. And, and all of his friends are like giving him bad advice. Like, yeah, you did this to yourself. Yeah. And it's like, 
hold on, man, I need somebody who can pick me up and help me, you know, right. get to your level. And, um, you know, the whole thing, show me your friends, I'll show you your future, man. What is, what's it look like when you have a bunch of healer friends who can mm-hmm. help you, you know, and even they go through a, a rough time too, and they need you. So it's, uh, you know, it, it works hand in hand. We need each other because we are expressions of each other. And uh, when you have a body of people with you who can go through that, it makes it a lot easier and a lot more fun. And, uh, and like I said, just doing life together as well. Um, Chris Garner mentioned in the comments, he mentioned the name of somebody that he, um, was listening to, and I, uh, he called Rife, somebody with the last name Rife, who, um, maybe talked a lot about, um, sound healing to cure cancer. And I know you go into a lot of that in your book as well. The, the whole sound healing to help to cure cancerous cells. You have some info on that as well? I do. And it's been proven. Um, in the UK, especially, they have worked with this stuff a lot more. They're a lot more open to it over there than we are here. And um, I posted out on my Facebook. Now, I can't remember. Um, my, it's my lolascarbro.com. That's my writer's uh, Facebook. But I put some articles out there um, where a woman was cured of stage four cancer. They had told her, and this was again in the UK, they had told her, now nah, you're dead, man. Look at the stuff in order. And um, she started working with these researchers that were doing sound healing. And her cancer was gone. And they've shown it time and time and time again, that it does have an effect on cancer as well as other diseases. So sound healing is very, very powerful. I talk about it quite a bit, like I said, in my book, because in America, we're a really interesting culture. I love America. I was born here. I'm an American to the core. Um, But there are places where we've got some mighty big blind spots where we could learn a lot from our brothers and sisters who embrace more of the mystical and I would say scientific understanding of the universe, which is all matter is in movement at all time. And we are matter in movement. It looks like we're solid. We really aren't. But that anything that vibrates at any level is going to affect us. And um, they have shown definitively uh, that it can work with cancer. You know, nothing's 100%, right? Mm-hmm. but it can cure cancer and yes that is right um going back to the um you know the reiki healing the laying on of hands the tapping and stuff like that i don't know if you know but i've seen a video one time <laughs> i don't know who it was i've only seen this once but it's a mode of healing or maybe even a, um um it could be some type of form of um um divination where they would ask a question but I remember the lady would bend her finger and wait for some type of sensation. She would ask a question and then bend her finger. It was really, you, I could feel it as she was doing it. I don't know if you've heard of anything like that, like bending your finger or maybe it's some type of modality of tapping or something like that. You've been able to feel it in your body, the energy code, maybe if they're talking to someone. But have you ever seen anything like that? No, I'll have to go check that out. I can't even remember the lady's name, but something with, with energy. It was really, um, so sometimes when you watch that stuff online or you see people who are really tapped in, you can feel it when you're mm-hmm. watching the videos, right? Oh, absolutely. One of them being God rest his soul, he just um, um, passed away. But I don't know if you know about this guy, um, Baba the Barber. The Cosmic Barber, have you checked out any of his videos or anything where he was in India and um, he would uh, he would give people um, shaves and ha- massages and he would massage their head and um, pull. But as he was doing it, he's pulling energy off of them. He's, pu- he's like pulling in his hands and throwing it out and doing these crazy massages. Uh, Baba the Cosmic Barber, which is really cool. I'll but have he, to go check yeah, him out. <laughs> he recently passed away this year, but... Um, those videos, they just suck you in. You're like, oh, my God. You can feel it as he's working on someone else, you know, but you're like, I wish I was there, <laughs> too, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so I know you just gave your website, but if people wanted to check out your work, where could they go to uh, check out what you got? You have a you have a yoga studio in Texas. You guys do re- retreats and things like that as well. What all do you uh, have to offer what, what you're doing? We do. Yeah, we do retreats and um 
we also, I do local healing, distance healing, life coaching. I work with people using um, Ayurveda as a healing modality. And I talk about what Ayurveda is on our website, which is Yoga Lola, Y-O-G-A-L-O-L-A, yogalola.com. Um, the, my other Facebook presence is Lola Scarborough.com. And that is where I put a lot of different articles about cancer and healing. You know, it's, I, it's a whole different kind of forum than the yogalola.com. So I put lots of stuff out there about cancer, about healing, about nutrition. Um, so, you know, I do things live. I do them remote, uh, you just check it all out through your website. Yeah. Website and Facebook. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation and judging by the uh, comment section on Facebook, everybody and Facebook and YouTube, everybody has as well. So thanks for coming on. I really appreciate this talk. It was awesome. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate being right, on your we'll, show. We'll have to do it again soon. Sounds good. All right. God bless my friend. God bless right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Lola Scarborough, ladies and gentlemen. Good talk. Good talk. Some minor uh, technical difficulties at the end, but we worked through it and we had a great conversation. Some really good stuff. Hope that it um, stirred up some things with, within you to uh, engage you to want to look into some of the things that we're talking about. Kundalini yoga, um, yoga in general, taking care of your spirit, spirit body, your spiritual health. Some people were um, asking about the different mats that we were talking about. I'm going to... Uh, let me see if I can type them in. One is a uh, acupuncture mat. They're cheap. Um, you can roll them out, and, and uh, she said there was something that you can lay on. I have one that you can stand on. They're really cheap online, but uh, uh, acupuncture mat. Um, and I'll put I'll put a link to these products in the description. And by uh, buying those products through my link, it would also support the show. So I will link to those products, the acupunct the acupressure mat, I'm sorry, and the um, the grounding mat. So I just bought one of those as well. That I don't have it yet, but it was the grounding mat. So those are the two mats that we talked about. Um, someone else asked me here in the question section. If anybody has any questions at the end of the show for me, uh, post them and I'll try to get to them. But someone asked about distilled water and do I drink distilled water? I'm not, I don't really practice distilled water drinking a lot. Like I'm not religious about it, but we do try to drink a lot of spring water. So there's a uh, natural spring up here close to our house that we go and fill up and we try to drink spring water as much as we can. So yeah. That's some uh, good stuff. But yeah, the um, sound healing, community, faith healing, you know what I'm saying? Just believing it. So much stuff that we covered, man. It was it was a beautiful discussion. And I always love linking back to the Holy Spirit and Kundalini. That's always, I lose, and I have to keep talking about that because I lose a lot of people there. I lose, oh my, they're just going to click off. Oh my God. Trust me, I get the comments that, you know. But I've stuck my head out there. That's one That's one that I believe in. I really do. I've done both. And I've, it's been beautiful encounters. And, um, you know, I love it. So making the distinction there between the spirit and um, and what it produces. And um, there's so much. You could just go on and on and on um, with it. So Triple M says, come on, man. What do they think when they see your logo? Yeah, uh, you know, I've had I've got a couple uh com- <laughs> comments on that logo. It's a beautiful logo. I love it with the TS True Seeker, but it does um look like the um serpent going around the staff of Moses, which you looked upon it and you've seen healing or what you received healing or the caduceus, which I have tattooed as well, which is uh it's the same symbol, but it's also the symbol for the rising kundalini energy, the the rising Holy Spirit, um, rising up the spine and attaining um, enlightenment. So as it rises up the spine and ignites the third eye.